An attempt to cover up a crime causes the deaths of 11 people. Our moment in crime is the case of Roger Dean and the Quakers Hill nursing home fire. Quote, I just quickly did what I could to get everyone out. End quote. At first glance, the man speaking to an Australian news crew about a devastating fire at the Quakers Hill nursing home appeared to be a hero. Roger Kingsley Dean was a 35-year-old night nursing manager at the home and he lived in Quakers Hill, a suburb of Sydney established in 1904. However, Dean wasn't the hero he appeared to be. He was the person responsible for starting the fire and causing the deaths of 11 people. The Quakers Hill nursing home was located on Hambledon Road. The home had only recently met accreditation and safety standards. Nearly 90 elderly men and women were residents in the home. This included Dorothy Wu, 85, Alma Smith, 73, Reginald Green, 87, Lola Bennett, 86, Ella Wood, 97, Urbana Alipio, 79, Caesar Galia, 82, Doris Beck, 96, Werner Webeck, 83, Dorothy Sterling, 80, and Neil G. Valke, 90. All of the 11 people mentioned would either die in the fire or in hospital. Three other residents would die as time went on, including Emanuela Cashier. Firefighters arrived at the home just after 5am on the 18th of November 2011. Two fire engines that each had a crew of four people came from a fire station that had only recently been built a couple of hundred metres away from the home. The fire had started in a ward at the back of the home. This ward was separate from other areas of the building and a fire door helped to stop the blaze from spreading. But the fire crew soon realised that they needed backup when they found that a second fire had started in another area of the home. The fire alarm had been ringing since 4.53am. During the early minutes of the fire, the emergency services focused on evacuating the residents. It wasn't an easy task. For example, when rescuers tried to push beds out of a side exit, a handrail jammed the first bed, preventing workers from taking bedridden residents outside to safety. The bed had to be moved back into the corridor. The residents who made it out of that exit had to be carried to the door and passed to emergency crews. The fire was so intense that the thermal imaging cameras used by the firefighters broke. Black smoke reached the floor and the fire spread to other parts of the building through the roof. Furniture was completely destroyed. In order to continue with the rescue efforts, firefighters were forced to crawl into each room. Unable to use their thermal imaging equipment, the firefighters had to use pattern searches to try and find residents who may have been trapped or who may have hidden. They first searched along the walls before checking the middle of the rooms. This plan helped to put out both fires and save lives. The fires were contained by 5.20am, but it would be a couple of hours before the rescue efforts were finished. There were fears about the building's stability and the roof eventually collapsed. 
for the firefighters, everything about the fire seemed to be part of a nightmarish scenario. New South Wales Fire and Rescue Commissioner Greg Mullins told the media, This is a firefighter's worst nightmare. Turning up to a nursing home with elderly people who can't get themselves out of harm's way. 32 residents were taken to hospital with smoke inhalation. Those who had suffered burns had to be sent to eight different hospitals. Firefighters had to hose down residents covered in soot. Residents of the Quakers Hill suburb got together to help those affected by the fire. Food and drink was provided and flowers were sent. The Quakers Hill Anglican Church opened up its doors for the nursing home's residents and their families. 40 to 50 members of the church's congregation arrived to offer help. Rooty Hill Nursing Home sent staff to the church to help care for and feed the residents. Some residents had Alzheimer's and dementia and many were on restricted diets and needed specialised care. The residents who were unharmed were later sent to other care homes. Strike Force Westall was created to investigate the cause of the fire and it was led by the State Crime Command's Homicide Squad. The home was examined by the New South Wales State Coroner, Mary Jerram, at 10.30am. Fingerprints were dusted for and police dogs sniffed for traces of accelerant. New South Wales Fire and Rescue Deputy Commissioner Jim Smith noted that a sprinkler system would have saved lives. The home didn't have a sprinkler system as they were not required by law. The home's furniture contained materials that had been banned in the US, the UK and from Australian places of public entertainment. Those materials hadn't been banned from nursing homes and hospitals. But the police moved quickly and Roger Dean was arrested before the day had even ended. Roger Dean was initially charged with four counts of murder. As the death toll rose, so did the amount of times Dean was charged with murder. But what would cause a man who had been trusted with the care of so many elderly people to start a deadly fire? Many possible causes were discussed in the media and no doubt by his defence team. Dean was bullied at school, he had a personality disorder and he wasn't on the best of terms with his family. But as security footage would later show, Dean started the fire to help cover up a theft and a drug addiction. Earlier on in Dean's shift that night, security cameras captured Dean entering the treatment room where the medication was kept 36 times. A later audit of the room found that 237 tablets of the opiate-based painkiller Endone was missing. The police were called to the home and Dean was questioned. But the police had to leave when they were radioed about a more urgent matter. To cover up the theft, Dean decided to start a fire. Dean started both fires in the home's high dependency unit. Using another staff member's cigarette lighter, Dean set fire to empty beds in two different rooms. At Dean's sentencing hearing, Resident Helen Perry recalled that she had been in one of the rooms the fire started in. When she asked Dean about the fire, Dean led her away, telling her that help was on the way. 
Dean showed no concern for the two women he left in the room where one of the fires was growing. Dorothy Wu and Dorothy Sterling were immobile. Both women died in the fire. All of the residents who died had been under Dean's care. Later on, when firefighters tried to locate one of the fires, Dean snuck back into the building to retrieve the drug register books that revealed his theft of the painkillers. After his arrest, Dean told the police that Satan had been speaking to him and that he had felt a sense of evil come over him. The 2nd of November 2012 saw Dean plead not guilty to eight counts of recklessly causing grievous bodily harm and 11 counts of murder. He'd wanted to plead guilty to manslaughter, but this was rejected by the Crown. He did plead guilty to two larceny charges relating to the theft of prescription painkillers from the nursing home. Dean's Supreme Court trial began on the 27th of May 2013, but on the morning the trial began, Dean pled guilty to all charges. Forensic psychiatrist Dr Michael Diamond found that Dean's decision-making was affected by long-term drug addiction and his personality disorder. But Justice Megan Latham disagreed. She said that Dean's actions were planned and that his moral culpability for the crime wasn't diminished by his personality disorder. A few months later, Dean was sentenced to life behind bars. When it was announced that Dean will never be paroled, the victim's families cried and applauded. Dean also received a minimum of six years to serve for the eight counts of recklessly causing grievous bodily harm. In December 2015, Dean lost his appeal against his life sentence in the Court of Criminal Appeal. Speaking at the appeal, Justice Julie Ward said, Having regard to the abuse by Mr Dean of the position of trust that he occupied and his deliberate actions in not taking steps to alert fire brigade officers, it cannot be said that the life sentences imposed on him were unreasonable or plainly unjust. An inquest into the fire began in September 2014 and the results were published on the 9th of March 2015. It found that the Quakers Hill Nursing Home Operators Domain Principal Group failed to look into Dean's past before employing him. Dean was suspended from his job at the private psychiatric care facility St John of God Hospital due to drug use. A patient complained that he couldn't administer her medication properly, had white froth around the mouth and was struggling to speak. A staff member noticed that he looked sedated, but Dean blamed this on the medication he was taking for a bipolar disorder. Dean's former boyfriend had noted that Dean was taking too many tablets, causing odd behaviour. While employed at the St George Hospital Mental Health Unit, Dean began stalking another employee after she expressed concern about his work. She had noticed that Dean was entering statistics into a patient database before the patients had been seen. Dean also damaged the same employee's car by covering it in white paint and sticking nails into the wheels. When an investigation was launched, Dean admitted to the damage and resigned. At his Quakers Hill nursing home interview, Dean's only listed recent employment was at a cheesecake shop 
where his flatmate had worked. Much of his resume was out of date. The nursing home didn't check Dean's work references and he didn't undergo a mental health check. Families of the victims want the domain principal group, now known as Opal Aged Care, to be held responsible for employing Dean. The former general manager of the group, Robert Johnson, was questioned at the inquest. The inquest revealed that the residents' families learned about the fire through the media. Families were upset at how the victims' belongings were returned. The belongings were left at a church hall, on verandas or under car ports. Some relatives received a cheque from the group, but had no personal contact from the management. At the inquest, New South Wales Deputy Coroner Hugh Dillon recommended some changes, including that a database of healthcare workers be created with details of their background, that workers be trained to recognise signs of co-workers abusing drugs, that nursing home doors and corridors be constructed to allow beds to be moved quickly during emergencies and that two firefighters receive bravery awards. The pain of losing loved ones in such a horrific way lingers on for the victims' families. That day will always be seen as, quote, chaotic and tragic, end quote, as the New South Wales Fire and Rescue Commissioner Greg Mullins described it. But perhaps the victims' families take some comfort in knowing that Roger Dean will never be released. The daughter of one of the victims, Neil G. Valke, said, My perfect scenario was that he would stand up and say, guilty to all charges, and what happened? He stood up and said, guilty to all charges. My prayers were answered.